Hi, I'm Danielle Oberosler, and this is Unordinary Made Ordinary, where we talk about the extraordinary experiences of everyday people. After today's interview, if you would like to continue the conversation of all things metaphysical, paranormal, or supernatural, feel free to join our private Facebook group by clicking on the link in the video description. So today I'm really excited because we've got Rick Wick to talk with us today, and he has already talked to my sister Julie in a previous uh, episode. It was called Time to Take Dreams Seriously, and I don't know if it was filmed in 2021 or 2023, 22. Do you remember? Uh, it, it wasn't too long ago. I think it was about uh, two years ago, so back in 2021. Well, thank you for uh, joining me today. Yeah, it's nice to be here. You contacted us to let us know that you had um, some more more to add on from your last inter interview with Julie, which I know you talked about astral travel. You talked mm. about wake induced lucid dreams. Yeah. Meditating in your dream and psychedelics. Yeah. So, well, I can just talk a little bit about how I've been doing meanwhile. Um, you know, I'm a guy who is big on taking notes. These are my notebooks. Um, this one goes back to 2018. So I'm, I'm very thorough in my work. And um, let's see if I find one of the more interesting ones. Uh, you know, I, I, I draw, I, I doodle, I make uh, illustrations about all the stuff that goes on. And over time, uh, these doodles have become kind of more, more and more dramatic. So here you have, you know, the classical uh, imagery of energy moving up the spine here, also burning sensation on the top of the head, which uh, is, you know, see this happened a while ago, but uh, I wasn't confident enough to to talk about what was going on but it seems that the more research i do uh these uh things i go through seem to match the certain descriptions that pop up in uh, various literatures so you have like yoga uh, with the kundalini activation uh, activating of dormant energy that it move. It comes from the spine. It can do that as well, but it's really this awareness energy. Um, and what it does is that it seems to uh, kind of uh, escalate whatever progress one already has. So if one is at a point of uh, learning something, suddenly there's a huge spike in the development, and there's a ton of stuff that gets learned faster. And there's a uh, there's there's more progress, more new stuff. And it also comes with a experience that lasts approximately, well, first, the most intense one lasts three days. And then there's, um, it gradually declines over three months, but it's still pretty intense. Um, so uh, did you have a Kundalini awakening? Yeah, uh, you know, people worked 40 years for this, so I don't want to, you know, yeah, it seems to be what I have, yeah. I think uh, they actually can work over lifetimes yeah. to achieve. And so I think if you experience one during your lifetime, it's because you've uh, cumulatively worked on it for much longer, possibly. Mm. That's a theory. Yeah. But was, did you have that Kundalini awakening since you talked to Julie? No, it was actually before, but uh, I didn't want to make mention of it because there were, I, I wasn't certain enough and uh, I, I needed to do more research. And I also like to cross reference it with other systems that are similar, um, such as, um, well, there's the system of Ka in Egypt. And then there's also in um, Judaism, there's something called the tree of life, which is a very similar structure with points. And I just uh, saw they, one. I'm not kidding. I just saw that, that symbol or with the. Yeah. Thoughts, the Sephiroth, yeah. Like an hour ago. And mm. I'm like, what's that? And somebody said it's a, a tree of life. Yeah. And it's, it's, it also has a progression where it starts at the base with very grounded things. And it splits off into masculine and feminine and works its way to unity at the top. So it's very similar to uh, the chakra system and the cause system. These, these are, I think these are 
probably talking about the same kind of experience. So uh, yeah, there's obviously similarities in that. Um, and so you're saying that um, that that has to do with your the Kundalini awakening, the the ka. And yeah, I mean, like we say Kundalini awakening because that's our word, right? But it's we're really talking about it's about a feeling, a experience, a uh, sensation, visuals, and and all of that that goes into the subjective experience of being while this is going on. So it's in different cultures they might call it Sephiroth. In this culture, they call it Kundalini, but they're pretty much talking about the same thing. And one guy described it one way, which gave rise to the Kundalini chakra system. And another guy described it in a way that gave life to the Sephiroth tree of life system, probably, is, is my, I, my I guess. Heard of it. I thought I've heard it like uh, described as a snake that goes up, like it's a serpent, mm. I'm sorry, a serpent that's inside our bodies mm. that like opens. Uh, there are definitely experiences like that. Uh, one time I... Uh, had this sort of sleep paralysis where it felt like there was snakes moving inside of my body. And there was also like, uh, not really hissing sounds, but like <sighs> sounds um, that, you know, yogic breathing, pretty much fire breath sounds uh, while this was happening. Um, you know, I, I have some um, notes here. This is, uh, it's um, what happened right before which was that I was doing this meditation. And um, this is me meditating first here, breathing fully in. So I, I look a little bit fat. And it says here, you know, <laughs> one, two, you know, the ways it, that it fills up from the bottom and it goes up. And then I held it for 20 is seconds. Is that one breath? Yeah. Is that one breath that you're filling up all this? Yes, you just... This you know, just trying to get in as much air as possible. And you, I, I was holding it and uh, then I breathed everything out. Uh, this is that, you know, everything is coming out. I'm looking very skinny here, my pants nearly falling off because, and it's like wow. first the mouth through the nose and like at the very end, it's like, you know, just to get out the very last air. Uh, but I actually yeah. had help. Uh, when I was doing this, uh, but it was from a strange source. Um, prior to this, uh, it was actually December year before. Uh, I was um, I was doing uh, some stuff with thinking and prayer and testing out prayer basically. So one of the things it says in the Bible is that uh, you should not waste words you should say the lord's prayer and nothing else uh so i did that and uh, uh that was not the thing that came first but it was the thing that made me notice that when i think very hard i can hear my thoughts as a voice and uh, that voice sound it has a high um it's like a radio voice or a walkie-talkie voice. It has like a high, um, I don't remember the, the, the lingo, the, the term for it when it comes to sound. In, in Norwegian, it's called the discount. Uh, I don't know what it's called in English. Is um, it like but, a, frequency, a frequency or something like that? Yeah, it's, it's like, you know, you know, like this walkie-talkie voice, basically. And the okay. thing about this kind of voice is that it mixes very well in with certain other humming sounds. So I would be thinking very loudly, if that makes sense. And the, the sound of my thought would sound like it was coming from air ventilation, pretty much. Hmm. Um, I would also be in like a uh, meditative prayer-like state. So it would be, um, there I think it was partially also being a little bit dissociated from it which yeah, some something along those lines but however that voice could also start talking on its own and it could guide the meditation and when it was guiding the meditation i was able to do it much more proficiently because it has more contact with it sees inside right 
the subconscious is seeing the mind from the inside and communicating back and okay look you're going to hold your breath for 20 seconds 20 19 and if if i could hold it for longer than 20 seconds it would slow down the count so when i was holding my breath i was like you know because it was i was being taken to the max and it was also this thing with if i'm going to hear the voice you have to be in that state so it would say uh it would basically give um, advice on what to do to silence the mind so i could hear the voice better um, and that this this felt provocatively for some reason. It felt provocative. Whose voice do you think it is? Is it is it you? Is it a spirit guide, higher self, somebody else entirely? What? Who is it? Um, I have a. It it's part of the experience, kind of. Um, but it's kind of dissociated away from me. And I'm kind of, as, as the, uh, I guess the, the yogis would say as the uh, shakti rises or as the awareness broadens and the mind expands, uh, this, these things float up to the surface. That's my explanation for it. It's just a theory. And um, because of that, I think, yeah, I, I basically think it's part of, I think everything is my consciousness, right? So... So that's the only thing I have access to is actually my subjective experience. And this process seems to give uh, more control over the subjective experience. So well, I'll, I'll try to maybe, yeah, I'm I'll sorry. try to explain with a um, maybe a screen share. Um, so. This is, it just sounds this like you're asked to hold your breath so long that you might almost pass out. So I'm oh, wondering... I almost died. I almost died. Uh, this is in my notes. <laughs> I'll show you. Um, I was this close from dying. Um, what happened was I was doing the exercises, doing this tremendous pressure. Uh, and what happened is uh, I, I did the exercise, right? And I hold my breath and the bed is right behind me and I lose I start getting blood pressure fall and I lose my balance and I fall backwards and my head uh, you know it falls just short of the bedpost if I had knocked the back of my head on that I would have probably gotten really hurt and I, I was actually thinking that while you know moving backwards I'm like ah, this is probably how I die well I died I died from meditation and that's a new one. So it doesn't sound very tough. <laughs> mm. So uh, yeah, I was pretty, you know, yeah, I, I, I survived anyways. And um, then a couple of days later, the, we did the meditation again together and it activated the thing that, and it was very obvious. This was not a gradual thing at all. This was like, you know, I, it was very dramatic. It was very noticeable. And I have this little humorous. Standing. Most people, um, when they're meditating, like, are you standing up? Uh, it's because the Kundalini uh, or the, the thing, it makes use of the spine. So I use the, the sensation and the awareness of the weight of my head going all the way down to the ground to bring it back up again and shoot through the head. So, so it's, it's the balance that kind of, yeah, that, that's a, that's the easiest word for it. It's like the balance of spine, uh, head cap of the skull into the spine, into the ground, but also at the same time from the ground equally back up again and into the top of the head. But could you not sit down straightly with your spine and your spine and your and all your chakras would still be over um, uh, against the ground and stacked? I don't know. I'm just asking you questions. Yeah. Well, I'm see, not heard of meditating is, understanding. That, that could probably work. Uh, and I've done that. But uh, there were like small things, small signs like before it happened. Uh, but though and then I was sitting and it was more calm um but uh the big one i was standing i have to be honest about that i was right. standing uh, i actually what happened this was exactly what happened it was a big strong reaction 
of the energy moving upwards and downwards at you know it's a very um, it was very balanced and then there was because the balance was perfect there was a feeling of oneness but then there was energy expanding and moving up very uh strongly and uh that caused a reaction where uh, there was suddenly a lot of uh, visuals you know a lot of uh, things in the walls that seemed to crawl and i i and i could hear more voices uh, more stuff basically so i decided to basically go and hide underneath the blanket in my bed and uh the next day i uh you know because i was pretty at this time you must understand i did not know what kundalini awakening was i had no teaching about this uh, i was not taught in anything of this just happened and uh, so what i did was i i immediately went uh back home on an airplane uh, which is of course producing these humming sounds that the voices can use to make themselves more pronounced so uh yeah i hear uh, noises much. like pe uh people who record evps this is for spirits yeah to, you know, they, they use humming noises sometimes because it can be manipulated yeah this is uh this is uh my experience as well that for instance like a sound like then they can go in between the the air and the noise and put their voice inside there and kind of manipulate the vibration to like send a message basically so are you hearing it with your ears or in your mind uh i can some of them they come in like from angles like in here or here and here uh but other times it comes from inside out uh, so there are multiple types of experiences uh, what is happening and as far as i can tell is that there is a um the subjective experience is controlled uh and has like a ton of locks on it so we don't get access to our entire potential at once so that we don't get overwhelmed and what when this so-called energy is positioned like this we can call it a dormant energy but as this is brought up to the surface uh, it, you can start to control it and one thing I can control is my hearing uh, but also it seems that uh, subconscious mind can also uh, control the hearing and this can offer some problems but yeah it hasn't been too many problems I have to be honest so when you saw the things crawling around, I guess, on your wall or in your wall and you mm. hid from them, like sometimes did your third eye open? Is that why you were seeing? Yeah, that is pretty. Eyes? Yeah. Yeah. Like every everything you have that's a sense gets leveled up uh, very uh, immediately. So you have to contend with regaining control for like, uh, yeah, three months. And it's it's pretty much like a uh, being on uh, constantly high on a psychedelic for three months pretty much so yeah so you're working to open basically your abilities open your third eye and then it opens yeah. and it's overwhelming and you're like too open too open <laughs> yeah <laughs> for three months uh, Close. but there there were like small drips of things happening before this experience but um it seems like this is not giving you stuff but it gives you energy and that makes the other stuff uh, appear more faster. So it's like, it's not like you get this and everything is solved. You still have to like use it to solve uh, and, and, you know, create stuff that you want to have an experience of. Um, so um, basically what I have for people today is I have a screen share with pictures on you know stuff people can do if uh, they want to try to uh, get it for themselves um and you know just important information and it's presented as pictures so it will be uh entertaining for people yeah sure it's share your screen um i'm just curious you said you still have to work on things that you want to uh have happened for yourself after your kundalini awakening and what were yeah. those things that you wanted to i'll give you an example now with my screen share because okay. um the way i've made this 
I show what I am seeing. So we're going to go into something that's used to be a very rare experience, which was wake-induced lucid dreaming. Once upon a time, that was pretty rare. Um, I'd love you to explain what that means. What is yes. wake-induced lucid wake dreaming? Wake-induced lucid dreaming is when you relax but stay aware because you can handle the relaxation without getting knocked out, pretty much. Okay. So when you do that, you enter the dream without um, basically losing your identity and having a like a mini ego death that you so 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 you remember who you are upon entering the dream, pretty much, right? Okay, because you're one awake. of the. Hmm? Because you're still awake. Yeah, yeah, like, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, you can put it that way. Um, I like to say that I still remember who I am, because my problem in dreams is that if when I arrive there, I don't remember who I am. So I simply become the situation. So if I'm wearing a tuxedo, I'm like, oh, what, what's going on? Well, I guess I'm James Bond, you know, and, and that's kind of like the logic I'll get if I'm not remembering who I am um and um how is this, one way i'm sorry but how is the wake induced lucid dream any different than meditating uh well meditating will usually not result in falling into the dream state and uh, i do other things with meditation i can only speak for me uh, i can get into that afterwards if you want sure. yeah i'm sorry um Go ahead. so so uh, one thing uh, that's very important about this energy is to use um, is to kind of use belief and faith in what you're doing. And one way I found to kind of make it easier to go into lucid dreams is self hypnosis by simply observing the darkness before I fall asleep. And then I might say. While, while I have my eyes locked, I might say, uh, oh, well, it seems that some points in here are darker and some are more like, uh, they're more light. So maybe there's some shades here. And because I say it, it will appear even faster. I, I think it, you know, very subtly, like, oh, it's kind of some light and some dark in here. It's not completely black. It's never completely black. And just philosophize about that. And be like, oh, I think I see some colors too. And then, you know, surely uh, I'll notice more of the color. And usually I tend to notice orange first. And I'll say, oh, those are some nice orange blobs. But uh, what, what are they supposed to be? What are they supposed to be? And they'll start to, you know, just take shape. And I'll say, um, well, I think that one is a frog. And then it'll start jumping around like a frog. And I say... Uh, I guess I must be in a forest and then the darkness will form to become trees. And sometimes when I do this, I do this all the way until I'm standing in the forest. Mm. So that's one way I induce uh, wake induced lucid dream. And you, I've even done this on the first sleep cycle, which is really difficult. Do you happen to know what color your aura is? Mm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Because my color that I see is usually a bluey purple color. And yeah. then I found out that that's actually my aura color. So I think what I'm seeing is, is my own aura. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I see the thing I've seen. I've seen other people in the astral, um, like these guys over here. Uh, so this is something I uh, achieved through uh, meditation, right? I, this is just just sitting and breathing. And then these guys will float into from, from the side of your eye and they will do like this and they will breathe and they will get like a fire going here. And then they'll bring their hands down to the position he's in and the, the light that's inside of them will kind of like leave. And as you see, this one has like a orange glow all around him with, uh, I guess it's purple inside. So that's something I uh, I've seen on meditation. You see, like Buddhist monks when you're meditating. Yeah, translucent glowing uh, Buddhist monks is common. That's something I've seen, and they always do this. this... 
and then they just fly out of their own body uh, like a fireball. That's that's what I see when I do meditation. But um, it depends on how. Look, this 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 didn't start like that. In the beginning, um, I, when I did mindfulness, the furthest I could do was just stop worrying about seeing with my eyes. And then upon returning, I see these blobs that are uh, orange and purple. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I was very proud of this when this happened. And like, oh my God, I'm seeing blobs. So I went on the internet and I said, uh, you know, I don't know about you guys, if you're having any, you know, progress with your meditation but i'm seeing purple and orange blobs and uh (laughs) then one guy said to me um okay but uh you know uh try to go deeper don't 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 settle for the orange and purple blobs see what happens if you go even deeper and um so i was like i thought about that and i was already in the kind of a cocky mood because i thought that this was the this was probably the pinnacle achievement uh, that anyone had ever done on meditation. Right. It's basically free, free psychedelics, right? So who? Yeah, no, I feel like this is where I start meditating right here. But I again yeah. I start with blue. You start with orange. <laughs> mm. So, uh, so that's um, yeah. Well, anyways, the, what was so genius about what he said was I was in a state of mind where that seemed like genuinely a really good idea because like I'm so good I'm seeing this I shouldn't have to settle for this let's go deeper so what I did next time uh was that when this stuff appeared I was like ah, no 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 I'm too good for you and I just kept relaxing and it didn't take long before I entered something that seems a little bit like this it opens up like a sliding door and i come into this space with a very uh spinning geometry a mirror like visuals crystal yeah. Up, yeah. yeah and no drugs no drugs uh just meditation so this is where i get uh th- this was what i got when i did that it was pretty immediate uh, also for some reason i had some beginner's luck that time and this happened how and what, one question how recently had you tried a psychedelic before you know like before you saw this like had oh, it been never week? you had never done a psychedelic before and this not, is what you saw. not before i saw this not before I'm this not one saying before i'm saying what was the time was it six months since since you had ever done a psychedelic was it a week what how long um when uh, when i saw this yeah from the last time you had done something like mushrooms or psychedelic yeah uh, this happened to me when i was living this was before my kundalini awakening because i was learning uh mindfulness as part of my psychology uh degree we had to attend courses. So at this point, I had not touched uh, like anything like mushrooms or any of that. So yeah. this is uh, this you can be certain that if you don't have that, you can still do this. Uh, you don't. Uh, I'm, but, you know, that's just my theory. Maybe some people would have to do that to get to that level. No, uh, I mean, but- no I, I believe I believe you and I've actually myself done that with meditation and then I've looked yeah. at like does the body make DMT when you're meditating like what is happening but mm. I also noticed that there is an after effect that lasts quite a while from a psychedelic um you know you don't have to try to meditate while you're on psychedelics you could do it a yeah. week later and still have I think some residual uh after mm. effects yeah it kind of it kind of opens up the um you kind of remember what it was like and then you go into that feeling and it seems to make it easier to it seems like it teaches you almost to to do this because the feeling you get and then you remember the feeling of say uh i remember remember right before the, um, it when i closed my eyes and it opened up i had this weird feeling and uh, and you sit and think about that with your eyes closed and maybe you even have a little bit of hope that it's going to work and then you believe it's going to work so you get all that great placebo and then it works so um so that's uh that's the experience i have with uh, say um ayahuasca I, I was able to get right back in a couple of weeks later uh because i was thinking so hard about it and 
I think uh, maybe maybe it's just natural, you know, it just shows it was what's possible to do. And uh, yeah, I believe I can do it now, but I'm not going to admit that. I'm just going to be very humble. And But, you know, it's probably going to happen soon. It could happen. It could happen. And sure enough, it happened. Uh, so that's something that has happened to me that I, yeah, I can say that that's something I've experienced. All right. Um, and, you know, what what lies at the foundation, which was like this huge thing for me, because I used to study psychology, which very much wants to be this useful science. Uh, so it's, you know, it tries to, you know, it really invests in scientific method and scientific evidence, testing, chemistry, biology. So, you know, to legitimize itself as a really, you know, heavy hitter, legit um, education. And that was at least what I got when I was there. So I got into this habit of thinking of reality like this, you know, I'm in reality, walking around in a outside objective reality. And my point of view, that's like the thought bubble. Uh, but this thing just, it has never existed. This is a, it's not even a theory, it's a framework that science can kind of exist on so we can agree on stuff. Um, and it's it's kind of like, science is in the business of what everybody else says and what everybody else is like the evidence right but reality if you really want to talk about reality you have to look at it it's this right but we never see this in comic books because that would be kind of strange but you kind of have it but it's it's the first person view which is kind of like uh that's that's the view and it's subjective so there can't be any outside objective reality because there's nobody around to observe it. Everybody's having a subjective experience. And um, then there's like stuff we don't notice so much that creates the constructs. Like we might see a color. It gives us thoughts, feelings, contemplations, habit, beliefs, assume. Like just something as small as looking at a color can have huge effect on uh, a work environment, like plants in the work environment, stuff like that goes into our constructs like yeah I like it at work I like it at work which is like just you know which is part of the whole thing it's that it, it's it's very vast there's a lot to it and what what I find with my experience that uh, after this kind of awakening thing was that uh, I get more access to the construction and this construction also, I also have more access to everything in the dark, right? You can see that as a metaphor for dormant energy that I'm unaware of. And as I get more access to it, I can actually have an effect on what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing, and what I'm sensing, uh, just through being a, practicing mindfulness about uh, different aspects of the experience of being me, such as taste, hearing, sight, uh, and also that can resurface in dreams. So dreams are a really good check to see how well you're doing. And recently, as recently as just a couple of days ago, um, I had a dream where I was feeling, you know, I was touching stuff and feeling it. And this has become something that's happens more and more often. And these are very, uh, very interesting experiences. Um, so did you have more screens to show? Yeah, okay. um, we can, uh, you, this is something. Those, um, those dreams where you're feeling stuff is, uh, are you, um, is that astral traveling then? I guess it is, I, I mean, for me, uh, when I talk about astral travel, I talk about stuff like um, I talk. I talk about like dimensions that are a little bit astral, like. Okay. So um, you know, different from say mushrooms, where you might see much sacred geometry. Here you have like, yeah, translucent people, castles floating in the middle of the universe, people dancing and turning into fireworks. Dreams are more like, oh no, I, I'm not wearing my clothes and I'm in public, right? So that would be more of a dream scenario. And then out of body experience would be I sit down and I fall asleep uh, or, or, or get very relaxed, you might say. And then I suddenly decide to rise up again. 
and I realize, oh shit, then my my I'm still in the same room. My body is behind there. Uh, let's try to, to wear my body. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I had one. Um, I I I'm I'm I know when I do it, and I usually go out here and through here into my living room, and then I'm just very impressed, and then then I snap back again, and wake up. So that's that's my like, latest experience with that. It's almost like you're haunting yourself. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So, okay. Um, so that's how I classify it. So if I talk about astral projecting, then I'm in a place that looks a little bit like my background here. Um, here's a um, here's a uh, wake. Here's a hypnagogic. Uh, hallucination I had a little while ago this one really filled up my entire line of vision and it was just it's it's geometry right and then I look at it and I say well that one looks a little bit like a train and it starts moving like it's a train with a bunch of wagons and it became like a toy land right a, a land made out of toys mm -hmm. so you know faith and being able to suggest to yourself is really seems to be really key to kind of like shape the experience. Uh, at least it is for me. It seems. I'm curious so, about your shape and how you have it looking like it to eyeballs and how they would see. Yeah, I know you're because that's my up. experience. So you see a shape like that, like it looks like a an eight on its side, where you're probably seeing with your third eye, which is one eye. Hmm um when it's third eye and these things um one thing that happened to me when i got home uh because i got the big kundalini blast and it was a little bit uh, scary and disorienting didn't know what it was called home to my parents went home to my parents as soon as possible boarded the first plane uh yeah pretty scared uh there was also screaming so my parents also were scared <laughs> and uh <laughs> So, but anyways, uh, when I came home, I closed my eyes because I was going to try to sleep with this stuff, right, for the first time. And as I look down at the tip of my nose, I see this. What is so this is a, uh, it's a labyrinth that shoots like balls through it. And there was, a, it was strong, uh, I would say, um, kind of red and purple energy and also white energy around the rift that opens up. It was kind of shining out with, uh, so that was something I looked That's at. On your nose right there? Yeah, I had to look down to see it. Uh, and it, 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 if I moved my eyes, this would not move. This would stay in place by, you know, underneath here. It would not move. So if I looked up, it wouldn't go here. It wouldn't, it wouldn't follow, it would stay here. It's like a uh, like a window almost and what and what do you think that is uh i don't know but they tend to appear uh between dreams and uh, i've had an, another one recently that looked a little bit more like um let's see what did that one look like yeah it looked like this and it came from this side of my vision and i looked at it and as I looked at it, I was like, okay, if I fall asleep, I will go into there. I think there's cool stuff in there. So I'll just fall asleep uh, or, or like try to, you know, I'll try to get inside of the picture, right? Yeah. And, and what if it looks like a game or like Las Vegas yeah. or a pinball machine? Yes, you know? it, start, it started out looking like uh, basically almost like Mario Kart or something like that. So I would go into this world. It would be a lot of neon. It would be very astral and video game like, uh, but like an old video game, like PlayStation Two graphics. <laughs> and I would fly through uh, this uh, this uh, raceway, pretty much that looked like it was from uh, a video game. And suddenly I would wake up somewhere else where I would have a conversation with a lady. And as she's talking to me, I realized that, oh, shit, this is this is the same thing again. I'm feeling. And uh, I think she said something along the lines of, well, you're not going to remember anything when you wake up. So it doesn't really matter. So I, I took a uh, I took a leap and I and I hurt myself so that I could feel pain so that I would remember that I was feeling. 
And the rest of the dream was pretty much me just, you know, running around talking to people and trying to figure things out. So, so that's my experience with that. Huh. Well, that's interesting. So, yeah, so these seem to be like you dream windows. In the dream. Hmm? You remembered it all because you hurt yourself in the dream. Yeah, like in you have to remember it in the dream so you don't get memory wiped away upon um, upon uh, awaking, because there's a there's a time window where it tries to memory wipe you after you wake up, and you have to resist that. Yeah, I had a couple of things recently where I was like, whatever it is I saw, I'm like must remember. So I forced myself awake. Like, must wake up now so I can remember. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. so hard, but I did it. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's always uh, it's always uh, fun when you win a little. Um, <laughs> yes. But yes. one of the things I, I think about is like how much other important stuff is happening in dreams that we don't remember because we're just we're just too knocked out from falling asleep because we 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 don't stay aware. Yeah. Um, I also do open eyes meditations. So, um, for instance, this is something that happens to me after the awakening with the Kundalini is that I could meditate, look down at my nose, uh, keep my eyes just, just down like this, just breathe in, breathe out, relax. And if I'm sleepy, sometimes this comes on. It's like a, uh, it's like a, uh, yeah, it's, it's like this. You know, I like see the people movie, in the... kind of like a scene is happening. Yeah, you... exactly. Yeah. Yeah. On top of my eyes. And and I, I can still see the room, but I also see the other place from like um almost like it downwards at 45 degrees angle, pretty much. Yeah, I close my eyes and I can see what looks like movies while I'm awake. Yeah. But hmm. yeah. So I know what you're talking this, about. Yeah, so, so so that's some that's a meditation I do with open eyes. Very easy. Just lay back in bed. You're sleepy. Look down here. Uh, look at your nose. Al almost close your eyes. And then just breathe uh, until the body thinks you're asleep. And then, you, you know, it starts doing this. And it's like, haha, got in. You know, I did it. So that's, a, that's something people can do. <laughs> so we can meditate by looking at Rick Wick's nose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I can do that. So that's <laughs> um, oh, and another thing. Um, one morning, uh, in the mornings, I sometimes get like visitor visions. Uh, these are called hypnopompic hallucinations. It's when you wake up. Um, and I saw this dream catcher thing in my ceiling and it was spinning around. And as I look at it, it's like, okay, this is what I see with my eyes open. So I closed my eyes and I saw these red people go into this portal and then the portal became, it left and it had like blue colors coming out of it, almost like uh, gas from a car, exhaust from a car. Huh. So that was uh, one, that was a weird thing that happened. And uh, yeah, it, and, and they're not like on they're not fixed to the eye it's like if it's there it's over there it's not on top of my eye it's in yeah the so if you, if you focus your eye over there then that image moves over there it's it's fixed yeah it's it's yeah. locked it's it's like it's uh, it's like uh it makes sense kind of <laughs> so um so that's something i get in the morning um and right now, uh, there's also this thing, if I look at my nose and I try to open it, but but if I don't manage to like, uh, you know, if I don't get deep enough, I go to, I get a little bit, you know, and and that will be like something like this, you know, I can kind of see the hallways, but I can't see like um, much detail and or color. I just see light and dark. And then I see the movement. So I see that there's like almost like moving through a hallway. And it's it's only here um, for some reason. So eye positioning seems to be really important for me in order to make this uh, work. Uh, yeah. And well, lastly, um, another one 
is, uh, you know, I, I have a ton of experiences, so you just have to stop me. But I, I think it's kind of interesting if anyone has had the same experience watching this, then it's kind of nice to compare notes. Um, sun gazing is a thing. Um, and uh, of course, you you're don't in... love your eyes, right? Yeah. So I always do it at sunset or, you know, try to not just look at the sun, but but it also works with uh, street lights. And I it's kind of like uh, you do the thing with uh, the eyelashes, it breaks up. And that seems to create a pattern that's open to be changed with suggestions for me. So I'll be like, well, what am I seeing? Well, maybe it's the entrance into uh, the golden city. And all of a sudden I will, you know, I will, it will change and arrange itself to become that. So, well, so. I, I just wanted to say, I had done a meditation a couple of weeks ago outside in the sunlight and you know how the sun goes through your eyelids and it's still yeah. light rays go through your eyelids. You still mm. could see things in those, uh, you don't have to keep your eyes open to look at the light. You can see it through the, the lids too. Yeah. But there's this weird thing with um, that I've experimented with because I also have a sleep mask. And, uh, you know, I, I, when I figure out stuff, what, what happened first was that I closed my eyes and I moved my hand in front of my eyes. So, of course, when I move my hand in front of my eyes, I see this right? There's a dark outline in the position of my hand, right? So I have my hand here and with my eyes closed, what I'm seeing is there's, there's this, right? This yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, I put on like tanning salon, those small ones. I put the shells on here and then I have a sleep mask on top of that. And I do this. I still see it. It's still there. It seems to be more like, um, the your awareness of space and the space you hold together with your uh, ability of having a experience of sight cooperate to create a body that you can see even with your eyes closed pretty much i well i do the same thing i wear a mask as well and i can see my my hand as well but yeah uh, i think that means your third eye is open <laughs> Yeah, and and it doesn't, you know, eyes. people are like, well, it, there must be some light that's getting in there. No, 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 no. I was very thorough uh, when I I took like tin foil outside of the of the tanning salon shells for my eyes, so that if there was light, it would be reflected back. If there was like any, you know, uh, and those are made of lead, by the way. So so you know they, they have lead so that the gamma rays don't get you um and yeah there's just no way this is uh, this is endogenous this is a experience that we create and are capable of no doubt about it um yeah. and when i'm when i meditate it opens up and sometimes i see places as well which is what we call remote viewing however now that i could do this uh i of course had to do a little experiment and i think I think this is the experiment I did. Let me take a look here. I think it was this. Yes, this is it. So I do this with my hand. And it, now the, the place, it's coming like, like this. And it starts out for me like a red orange glow. And when it comes to a, when it comes close enough, it opens up. And it passes through the veil almost, and then I can see. So I move my hand as, as soon as I see this, because this has to be tested. And I see this, okay? And it was uh, these yellow things attached to me. I saw that. Um, yeah, that, that's just what I saw. And I tried to convey this as um, closely as possible to what I saw. I when love I moved it. This. Yeah, I love that. I have not... When I see a different place, I've never tried putting my hand out. Yeah. I've never so thought I'm, about that. So that's, that's something you got to try and see. If you see these wires, uh, let me know. <laughs> because <laughs> this was, this is kind of like, this is like an existential crisis right here. Like, oh my God, I'm, I might be somebody else in a different place who's strapped up to a machine or something. Or but, you uh, that maybe that's what your energy body looks like. 
Yeah. Um, You're lumpy or, with wires. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that could be it. That could be it. Uh, I, I immediately just thought that this might be some virtual sim simulator thing that has all these things so that we will feel touch or something like that. Um, but oh, so I, do, I, you, do you believe that? Do you believe that you're in a simulation? No, but, or, or even if it was, it wouldn't really matter because see, the thing is, uh, these outside objective things, they don't hold up if you get a Kundalini activation or some sort of experience like that, because then it strips it away, right? So you're only left with, you're only left with having to deal with this. Uh, and if you, because it's too much, it's too much, you have to deal with the subjective experience and be, keep it real, so to speak. So I think that if you do that, uh, you, you've, okay, so you've shifted reality and come into a different reality, but you've really just traded, um, you've just traded one society for another and you haven't really done anything spiritual. If you can master this, you can pretty much do whatever you want with your consciousness. You can own your own consciousness, not just your personal, you know, uh, freedom by the law, but the freedom to shape whatever experience it is that you would want potentially just by like, now nah, I'm going to do, I'm going to be at the beach right now. I want to be at the beach while you're in your living room. No, I'm not. And just if you have that level of control, of course. So, so that's what I consider to be the end all be all end game to to have to have all the access to the life energy to have 100% access to yourself because it's it's actually all you really have the the outside objective reality is the scientific theory that they keep uh because they don't allow things that could disprove it to be legit evidence like I, oh, if you don't have that experience, uh, then you're insane, right? So hallucinations, all of these things, um, the, they are things that could threaten a model of a outside objective reality and science. So um, what you do to keep science so you can be pragmatic about stuff is that you label it as abnormal and as suffering and dangerous, and they need to be medicated, for instance. Um, are you done sharing the screens? uh i have uh let's see what we got i want to cut you uh, off but i think if you're gonna just talk then we should um make the the yeah. video yes um yeah I, I i think i'm about done i've shown pretty much everything i have so uh oh i love I'm that you drew all these things i mean i do this stuff too so i draw but i haven't drawn like the way the clouds and the colors look when I close my eyes, you know what I mean? Mm. I never thought to do that. I just describe it to people. And I usually say that when I see those colors, that's, I know I've got like my window. Um, I can, yeah. I can view wherever I want. Uh, how's your experience with once you get a view and it stops? Uh, I find it to be very difficult to get back in there. It's almost like I've spent energy and I have to wait for it to restore or something. Um, sometimes I'm like looking at a place and I don't really know why I'm looking at it. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like, why am I here? And then I go somewhere else. I'm like, now, why am I here? You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I have no control over what I'm doing at all. Yeah. So I, I find that to be an issue too. the issue of, um, we have all this ability, but, uh, like, uh, if you look at just dreams, I like to take dreams as an example, because it's one we all can. You know, anybody, you can have a dream tonight, you know, if you wonder what it's like. So as you, we go to bed, feel tired, and pretend to sleep. And at some point, uh, we have like a mini uh, amnesia of who we are, and we lose complete, you know, uh, consciousness. Uh, it's almost like mini death. And somewhere in this sensory deprivation state, we start constructing our own reality and we start interacting with it, not really conscious, just 
observing the environment and very often just looking at the environment. Like I gave the example, if I'm wearing a tuxedo, well, I guess I'm James Bond. That, that's the guy who wears the tuxedo. So that's, that's got to be me. Uh, and, uh, and then we just become the situation. But then sometimes we become lucid. It's like, oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, I know what this is. And, and then, then you have more control. Uh, and so, so it gives this example of huge consciousness, tons of power. Uh, computing power unrivaled can create entire realities, can render entire realities with touch if you practice the awareness of touch enough for it to appear in dreams. So basically, like powers of a god right here, zero control, on the other hand. So <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no. And I don't think I experience where I don't know who I am or have amnesia when I'm sleeping. Mm. I, I get it in the in the for me, I try to do wake induced dreaming on the on the first sleep cycle. So usually I fail because I'm like, oh, this is pretty good. And then I'm out. <laughs> right. So I get not I get knocked out, as I call it. And you know, the the, the dream won, you know, the, the sleep come and <laughs> came and claimed me. So uh, so I consider that point. like yeah, I can I I kind of consider it like a mini ego death. Uh a very calm ego death that's you know, it's not any resistance at all. It's just so tempting that I just uh, I just drift off. And uh, yeah, that's that's one way I look at it. Wow. So, uh, I, I sleep I, deeply and I barely ever remember my dreams. I, I really wish I did remember mm. them more. But I do play this little recording for myself that's like four minutes and it's yeah. affirmations that, you know, my shaman has me saying to myself and I'm like, it's just easier to record it and play it when I'm sleeping. I don't even hear maybe a minute of it and I'm out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, that that often happens. Four with, uh, minutes. Uh, you know, uh, in in uh, mindfulness meditations on body scanning, where we work from the bottom of the soles of the feet all the way up to the top of the head, very common. Those are very relaxing. Um, and one of the things that changed after uh, this experience I had is that I, I start getting visions from different parts on my body. So some people will say that, yeah, that's because memories are stored in your body. But so like I'll, I'll meditate um, on body scanning and it'll come to the heart. You know, notice your heartbeat and just relax. Notice your heartbeat. And I'll, I'll sort of drift off into not really a sleep, but a trance. And I'll receive a like five second video clip of uh, a heart a man dressed as a heart uh, coming out of his house saying maybe art is my food and and then uh, then it just stops maybe uh you're getting information from your yellow wired heart sack <laughs> yeah it's uh yeah well well it's i think it's nice um uh, i i think the there should be like uh um, you know, a, a healthy spiritual body should, at the very least, be able to provide some sort of answers and advice, right? So, so oh, I like uh, yeah, I'm, I feel pretty good about that. Um, yeah. Well, um, so you are. Uh, I'm actually kind of jealous about your Kundalini awakening. I hear it's painful. I've heard it's painful. Oh, it sounds... oh, yeah. It's it's not. <laughs> it's a. Uh, it's it, the uh, well uh, the first uh, three months are uh, yeah they're they're pretty hard yeah. Um, um, I also you said you were about to go to another country. Yeah, um, you know I'm pretty much deep in the spiritual quest at this point. So at some point I'm learning Spanish on Duolingo right now. It's, I'm doing pretty well, and I'm planning to go to uh, Cusco. Uh, which is a place that has the sacred valley, but they also have a very long tradition of plant medicine. And it's also, you know, I've been there before. Um, I was in, I was at the ayahuasca resort in Peru, where I wrote this book about all my experiences with the ayahuasca. And um, I, I didn't really get to see Cusco. Uh, I, I, I went there to work. I hustled all the time. And um, yeah, so 
I want to kind of go back and take it more at my own pace and look at also the language of the Shipibo shamans, because in their tradition, uh, they've always been talking and communing with spirits. So they say that their language is actually a collaboration between the, the spirits and themselves, because it was con they constructed the language together. Um, they, they had influence on that. So that would be interesting. I know that the word to be is also like to be born in Shipibo language. So there's many, many small details like that that are really fascinating about it. And, and um, said, how long are you going to be down there? Oh, um, well, um, there's really no rush because I frankly I can afford to stay there uh, for you know a couple you know a good while uh, the hotels are really cheap the hotels are really cheap i looked at it, it's like oh my god that's that's cheaper than my apartment and it's like house cleaning everything you know every day for free <laughs> included in that price basically so you're yeah gonna be, you're gonna study shamanic practices and plant, and plant medicine. medicine yeah and get really close with the uh, Try to, you know, try to basically level up, you know, see if I can <laughs> make something happen. And uh, I hope it goes well. So, so that's going to be the next thing I do. And, uh, you know, see, see if I got something in there, if, if there's something there. And, uh, well, I think you know, you'll have to contact us and let us know a, if you have great Wi Fi and we can actually do another Zoom while you're yeah. there. But, um, it's any the... updates and lessons you learn while you're there? Mm, yeah, it would be really uh, would be really fun to do that um, properly because it's one of those subjects. You know, um, for instance, um, there's the old medicine known as ololiqui that contains this um, lysergic acid that can cure um, it can cure uh, cluster headaches. Many people self medicate with that, and that's on a sub perceptual dose. So you don't have any effects uh, that are like hallucinatory or anything from it. And, uh, but because it's like a tryptamine class, it's closely related, to, similar to LSD, uh, people don't get it as medication, but it's like super cheap medication because all you have to do is to grow some morning glories or grow some other flower that has seeds that contain the same thing. So I want to be very, very thorough gorgeous. if I do that. Aren't they very poisonous, Morning Glory? Uh, yes, but there are things you can do to extract. Uh, I, I'm thinking like if, if people were given this as medication, then there would probably be some system in place to just extract the, the thing that they need. And then, uh, you know, they have a small little thing that they can uh, take that won't really affect them that much, but it'll actually cure and stop and or postpone the the cluster headache and cluster headaches are a pretty serious deal right uh, there are people who who live in fear because they're you know they just got out of a cluster headache and you know they don't when is the next one coming so uh, oh, that sounds um that sounds so interesting and i actually know somebody who would probably be interested in taking that medicine yeah uh, we'll have so, to jot down this note yeah so, um what was I going to say? But I want to, I want to, because it actually has really good uh, research behind it. Uh, you know, there used to be less research. Now it's coming more and more. So if I do something like that, I would like to, you know, just quickly, just take it easy, guys. Don't believe the 60s propaganda. We have newer, fresher research because a lot of the 60s propaganda uh, has also come, you know, it also comes into the school system, right? So, uh, so things change very slowly, and in order to kind of get people, uh, you know, out of the well, I believe I, I was told that as a kid, so it it has to be true. Uh, so you you kind of have to provide good good evidence, and you know, just just a little citation, you know, so that they can be confident that uh, you know it's uh, the, you know it's it's safe basically maybe from um peru you can fill us in on all the knowledge you gain about plant medicine yeah but for now uh, I think we're coming up on an hour so um if there's any of uh, final message you'd like to share with everybody 
a message from your heart? Yes, actually, there is one thing. And I'm actually going to have to um, share. It's just a little thing I want to show people. And they can pause uh, because I'm going to share screen. And okay. this is the key to to... For me, this has been the biggest key, so I have to I have to share this one, and it's this. Uh, this is like having a, this. This here is constructed to be a perfect day, but the thing is, um, you don't have to complete everything. I don't complete everything. I just overshoot so that if I have a really good day, uh, I might get uh, a little bit more than half of this done. So I keep this with me. Uh, as I said, I'm. Uh, I this is the, the same book that this is from and one of the things if if just one thing um the dream checks it makes little check boxes for dream checks and uh you'll find yourself doing dream checks and you can give yourself a pat on the back yeah i did my dream checks or something like that what is a dream uh, check? oh uh, that could be just it's a it's a awareness exercise basically you stop it's like wait 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 am i aware Am I here? Where am I? Am I dreaming? What What is my awareness like in this moment? And you check your awareness. Okay. By the feeling of my awareness, I think it's safe to assume that at this point in time, I'm not dreaming. That's a dream check, basically. And what it does is that it becomes a habit. And then you start doing it in your dreams. And because it's related to your awareness, instead of like the action such as uh, touching a anchor which is also a good dream check by the way it's n by no means bad um you can many people do this one i do this one all the time so i but but i like to connect it to my awareness because then every once in a while you get lucky in your dream and it's like whoa, whoa, whoa. ah it's this awareness oh i'm lucid so so that's it's a little bit more subtle it's a little bit harder to take away from you and you know the thing with me is i can feel this in my dream so this one doesn't work unless i get you know the bungee uh, cartoony um effect that shows that no no we're in we're in la la land so <laughs> so i have to use my awareness more okay well, um, thank you so much for sharing with us today about your Kundalini. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, no, that was awesome. I didn't even know what we were going to talk about today. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but it might be astral stuff, but I'm uh, I'm pleasantly surprised. Oh, thank you. That's uh, that's how, good to hear. How would you like people to contact you if they watch this and they want they want to reach well, out? Well, I'm in the group. I'm in the group. Uh, an ordinary made ordinary. Okay, uh, so, on Facebook. Yeah. So that's, we will, that's probably the best place, most we'll relevant place. For you, we'll put a link to connect to you um, in the video description. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to everyone for watching. Um, if you like this kind of content, be sure to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon, like and comment. We love to hear from all of you. And we really hope that you're having a wonderful day.